I don't think anyone could quarrel with the assertion that in this century the two most influential philosophers in the English-speaking world have been Bertrand Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein. Russell, besides being a great philosopher, was a tremendous public figure. Immersed in political and social affairs nearly all his life, he became exceedingly familiar to the general public as a broadcaster and journalist and social critic, so people came to associate him quite rightly with certain general ideas and with a particular approach to social problems, even if they didn't know much about his philosophy, the best of which in any case was highly mathematical and technical and therefore not really accessible to the non-specialist. Wittgenstein was quite different. He was only a technical philosopher. He took no part in public activity, shunned exposure even within his own profession, published very little. The result of this is that for a long time his influence, though immense, was confined to full-time students of philosophy. Only comparatively recently has this influence begun to seep out into surrounding areas of thought and affect people in other fields of activity. So the situation now is that a very large number of people have heard of Wittgenstein who don't really have any idea at all of what he did or why it's important. In this program we're going to try and rectify that a bit and as far as is possible in the short space of a single program to bring out clearly the main lines of Wittgenstein's thought and say something about what its influence has been outside as well as inside philosophy. This not easy task is being taken on by Anthony Quinton fellow of New College, Oxford, where he's been teaching philosophy now for over 20 years. Mr. Quinton is currently also writing a history of philosophy in which Wittgenstein will be treated at some considerable length. But before I invite Anthony Quinton to start talking about Wittgenstein's ideas, I'd like myself, if I may, to say something about Wittgenstein the man. He was born in Vienna in 1889 and died in Cambridge in 1951, having incidentally become a British subject in his middle age. His father was the richest and most powerful steel magnate in Austria. And as a young child, Wittgenstein developed a passionate interest in machinery, which was to set the pattern for his whole education. His parents sent him to a school that specialised in mathematics and the physical sciences, and he went on from there to become a student in mechanical engineering. At the age of 19, he came to Britain as a research student in engineering at Manchester University. And it was while he was there that he became fascinated by what were, in fact, philosophical questions about the foundations of the mathematics he was using. He read Bertrand Russell's great book, The Principles of Mathematics, and this seems to have been a kind of revelation to him. He threw up engineering and went to Cambridge to study logic under Russell. And within a very short time indeed, he was producing original work of his own, which many people have regarded from that day to this as work of genius. It resulted, in the only <clears throat> it resulted in the only book of his to be published during his lifetime, a book with the somewhat off-putting title Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, usually referred to by philosophers simply as the Tractatus. It was published in Austria in 1929 and in England in 1920. It was published in Austria in 1921 and in England in 1922. It's very short, but certainly one of the most influential works of philosophy to be published in this century. However, while it was exerting this tremendous influence over subsequent years, Wittgenstein himself was becoming more and more discontented with it. In fact, he came to the view that it was fundamentally mistaken, and he produced a whole new philosophy which repudiated his earlier one. During his lifetime, this second philosophy was disseminated only to and through his students at Cambridge. But after his death, a whole mass of writings came out which embodied it too. The most important of these was a book called Philosophical Investigations, which was published in 1953, and which then proceeded to have as great an influence as the Tractatus had had 30 years before. This is a unique phenomenon in the whole history of philosophy, a philosopher of genius producing two different and incompatible philosophies, each of which decisively influenced a whole generation. Well, now we must go back to the beginning and follow this story through in terms of the ideas involved. First, the Tractatus, then, produced during the second decade of this century. Anthony Quinton, it's a very short book. It's less than 80 pages in the standard edition. Uh, what would you say are the central problems that Wittgenstein was trying to solve in it? I think the shortest way of stating the central problem of the book is as follows. How is language possible? People had assumed, made all sorts of assumptions about meaning, 
previously how people attach meaning to words. Wittgenstein immensely generalized the question and said, how in general is it possible for human beings by producing marks on paper or making noises to represent something that was utterly different in character from the marks and noises used to represent them? I think many of the people watching this program might not see at once why that is a problem. People are inclined to take language for granted. Why should the very existence of language present a philosophical problem? Well, if one looks at the world in a more or less statistical way, in a great deal of it, things interact causally with each other, rocks bang against rocks, moons influence tides, and so on. But just here and there in the world is this extraordinary phenomenon of some elements in the world intelligently reproducing other elements of it in themselves. Agree, I agree, of course, it's the, the texture of our whole inner lives, the use of language, the understanding of language, our communication with our fellow men, of course, principally, though not exclusively, takes place through it. I think it's just one of those questions that seems so obvious that most people don't bother to ask it, rather like Newton asking seriously why the planets didn't charge off in all directions, why stones dropped when released from the hand. It's got the same naive, pristine fundamentalness. In other words, we have this ability to think about and therefore handle, in a sense, things which are not present to us. And this is made possible by language, or made partly made possible by language. And this raises two sets of questions. What is the relationship of language to the world? And what is the relationship of language to thought? And I take you to agree that both of these questions are central to what the Tractatus is trying to do. Yes, people had asked questions about these things, as it were, in a piecemeal way before. The great fascination of the Tractatus is they're asked with the utmost conceivable generality. And to both of the things you mentioned, he has answers to give. There's this apparently not very uh, helpful answer in the first, at first glance that language represents the world by depicting it. Propositions are pictures, he says, of facts. And equally, propositions are expressions of thought. They're the vehicles of thought. They're what we think with. Now, there's another side to this coin, isn't there, that he was also concerned with. The very fact that he was concerned with the limits of what could be expressed in language and discovering what the limits were to what language could do meant that he was also concerned with what language can't do. This was a very essential feature of the whole operation, and perhaps in some ways one of those that's had the largest possible influence is insistence that the limits of language were clearly statable. And all this followed from his idea that language is essentially, and I have to insist literally, pictorial in character. There's a well-known anecdote about Wittgenstein hearing of the use of some models in a French law court, I think it was, to represent the state of affairs in some street accident. And he had, confronted with this, the sort of experience that Archimedes cried Eureka about. This is it. I've got it. He said, that is the essence of language. And this put very serious constraints on language, that language had exactly to mirror states of affairs in which objects were engaged. And so this put limits to of a very marked kind on what could be said in his view. In particular, he thought that the relation of language to the world itself couldn't be meaningfully represented in language or discussed in language. Let's, I think we, we've, we've, we've got a, a pretty clear view now of what, uh, what the problems were that he was addressing himself to in this book. We now have to start considering what the solutions were that he put forward. Uh, what did he come round to saying the scope of language was? and to saying the limits to its use were? The fundamental thing, I think, here can be put in two points. First of all, that language has to fit the world very directly in that it has to be constituted, a, a meaningful assertion, a meaningful proposition, has to be constituted of names that fit directly onto objects that are exactly correlated with the objects they're the names of. And then, a true proposition, a genuine proposition, will be an arrangement of names that mirrors the arrangement of the objects it treats of. Now, this limits language, in a sense, to description of that which is outside language. That's the uh, limiting uh, feature of that. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I've foozled it. I've lost no. the second thing. <clears throat> that's all right. No, well, that, I, that's, you said there were... 
uh, you've mentioned you've mentioned what's often referred to as the picture theory of language. I think it's very difficult for uh, people to see in what sense a sentence can be a picture of a fact, or a sentence can be a picture of any piece of reality. Can you explain that a bit better? Well, I think his point is that the sentences of ordinary language don't look like pictures. But his contention is, if they are to have any meaning, they must be capable of being analyzed or decomposed into a set of ultimate elementary sentences, which really are pictures, which consist purely of names directly correlated with the objects that are being taught, talked about, and in which the arrangement of names mirrors the arrangement of the objects. Let me recapitulate this to see if, if we've got it absolutely clear between us. But Wittgenstein thought that if you analysed any utterance about the world, you could analyse it down into words which were names of things, and the relationship between the words in the sentence corresponded to the relationship between things in the real world. And in this way, the sentence was able to picture the world. That's right. And that was a purely argumentative assumption, as it were. He argued that from first principles. He's, he argued that it was necessitated by the requirement he laid down that every genuine proposition must have a definite sense. And he thought no proposition could have a definite sense unless it was ultimately made up of these fundamental pictorial <coughs> propositions. Well, now, sorry. I, he he well, doesn't give any examples of these pictorial propositions. Other philosophers he influenced came forward with examples of them, but he abstains altogether from giving the examples. He just says it can, he thinks, be proved that there must be propositions of this ultimate pictorial kind. But now, one immediate uh, uh, query that occurs to one is this. A great many of the things that we say are false or untrue. Uh, that means that I, in those cases, utter something to which there is nothing in the world that corresponds. Now, how does he explain that? Well, it emerges fairly simply from what's come out so far. Objects can be arranged in various different ways, and the names we have for those objects it can also be arranged in various different ways. A significant proposition assembles a set of names in one of the possible configurations that those names allow for, and the possibilities of combination of the names is directly parallel to the possibility of the combinations of the objects. So uh, a meaningful proposition, as such, depicts a possible state of affairs if the arrangement of the objects referred to by the proposition is identical with the arrangement of the names of the objects in the proposition, then the proposition is true. So the counters can be moved around, as it were, in various configurations. Most of these will represent simply possible states of affairs. When they're configured or arranged in the way the objects referred to are arranged, then the proposition is true. A lot of the things that we say in ordinary life, uh, and indeed in philosophy too, aren't about states of affairs at all. We make uh, moral judgments, uh, aesthetic evaluations, and so on and so forth. How are these explained by this theory of language? Well, as far as um, ethical and aesthetic judgments are concerned, they're not in fact explained. They're just said to be not part of language proper. This ethics, is a very eccentric thing for anyone to say, isn't it? Ethics is transcendental. <clears throat> ethics, he maintains, does not deal with fact. And his, he insists that the real function of language is the describing of fact, truly if possible, mean, falsely if meaningful, but that is what language fundamentally is. In other words, uh, when I utter a sentence about the world, I am arranging names together in a way which corresponds to a, set, a possible arrangement in the world. If that arrangement is actualized in the world, then my statement is true. If it's a possible statement of a state of affairs in the world which is not actualized, then my statement is false. If the state of affairs isn't possible in the world at all, then my utterance is meaningless. That's correct. So we've got a threefold analysis into true, false, and Meaning. meaningless. Now, this theory of language implies that the world must be of a certain kind. That is to say that the world, independently of our sort of language, must consist of ultimately simple objects which are related to each other in certain ways. Is that so? That's precisely what he says. And that is what he asserts right at the beginning of the book in an unargued way. He says the world consists of facts. Facts are arrangement of objects. Objects must be simple, to take up the word you used. And 
these come at one, as one reads the book, simply as dogmatic affirmations, but they receive their support later on from the thesis that language has to have a definite sense, and it can have a definite sense only if it is of a certain structure, and therefore the world must be of that structure in order to be capable of being represented in language. Now, what about the unsayable? We were talking earlier about Wittgenstein's concern with what can't be said as the other side of the same coin with his, as his concern with what can be said. What does the theory of language, as we've now drawn it out, have to say about what can't be said? I suppose the central feature of the doctrine of what can't be said, the one that's most philosophically important about it, is that nothing can be said about the relation of language to the world. This is the vital paradox of the Tractatus, that right towards the end he says anyone who understands my propositions will recognize that they're senseless, and then tries to mitigate the paradox by saying he must conceive them as a ladder on which he's mounted to a level of understanding, which he then kicks away. Uh, he, he, his thesis, after all, is that language and the world have to share a certain structure for it to be possible for language to represent the world, and then says that this is not a fact about which discourse can um, proceed. It's something that shows itself in language, but language can't be used to report. And so philosophy, as it were, undermines itself in this mode of argument. Would it be true to say that, that, that this is what he's doing then, that, that uh, for a sentence to mirror the world, <clears throat> there's not only got to be a one-to-one -one correlation between names in the sentence and objects in the world, there's also got to be a structure internal to the sentence which relates the names in the sentence to each other in a way that corresponds to the way that objects in the world are related to each other. And that this structure is exhibited by the proposition. It's not something that's stated by it. Precisely. And therefore, it's shown in the proposition but can't be expressed in language. Yes, and in the light of that, then he has to represent his own remarks in the Tractatus as drawing our attention to what is open to view, what is there shown if we only look the right way, but that the propositions themselves are literally senseless. But of course, much else is, to be, is said to be nonsensical by him. You mentioned a few moments ago judgments of value. These, he says, are, in a rather unhelpful word, transcendental, but it simply means they're not matters of describable fact. And he gives no positive account in this book as to what they are then as an alternative. And of course, he's extremely hostile to past philosophy, which purports to tell one all sorts of things about the world, when what it is in fact doing is saying things in a hidden dialogue, in a hidden dialect, a, a code almost, about the relation of language to the world, which has to be shown and can't be described. Why did people think that this doctrine was so marvellous? I mean, why, why did this philosophy have the enormous impact that it did? Because it does seem to me to be a very strange one, and it does seem to me to leave an awful lot out. Uh, for example, uh, I would have thought that the most expressive use of uses of language that there are are those in creative art, in poetry, drama, novels, and so on both the most sophisticated uses of language and the profoundest. And yet this theory of Wittgenstein simply allow, seems to allow no place for an explanation of these uses of language at all. It seems very limited, very partial. Would you accept that criticism of it? Yes, um, it is limited, but I think if called upon to defend it, he would perhaps say that all other uses of language, insofar as they can be taken seriously and aren't some form of wordplay, require the explanation of this fundamental descriptive employment, world-describing employment of language first of all. But about why people thought it was important, you mentioned as an argument against its being important that it was, that it was strange. But I should thought part of the fascination just was that it was so strange. It's not, one might say, a terribly modestly expressed book. In the preface he says, I am convinced that the final solution to all philosophical problems is contained here. And of course, quite compatibly with that, he there and then gave up philosophy once for a considerable period, 10 years or so, once he'd completed the Tractatus. So its strangeness is part of its appeal. But it's not only that, it's 
its, its literary quality is rather striking. It's like a voice speaking out of a whirlwind. These short, pregnant, aphoristic sentences. I'll give you a couple of examples. The first one, the world is everything that is the case. It's one of those baffling announcements that one doesn't quite know what to make of. The last one, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must remain silent. Um, one first sight, that looks like a truism. And then one realizes it isn't quite a truism. He says it's the essential message of the whole book, is to draw the limits of what can intelligently, intelligibly be said. I suppose the first thing that strikes anyone about the book when they pick it up for the first time is the way it's written, because it's written in not in continuous prose at all, but in very brief paragraphs, numbered according to a very elaborate system of subdivisions and sub-subdivisions and even sub-sub-subdivisions. Uh, and some of these paragraphs are only one sentence long. And as you've just indicated in what you said, the connection between them aren't always very obvious, nor is their meaning in itself very obvious either. Why did he write in this enigmatic, uh, almost hermetic way? Well, he was an immensely fastidious man in all respects, I presume, but certainly there's evidence for any reader of what one might call his intellectual fastidiousness. He detested what I suppose one I have to call bourgeois academic philosophy, the idea of philosophy as a trade, a nine-to-five occupation, which you do with a part of yourself, and then you go off and lead the rest of your life in independence of it. He was a man of the utmost moral intensity, of extreme passionate seriousness. He took himself with very great seriousness. He took his own work with very great seriousness. When it wasn't going well, he got into a desperate and agonized condition. The result of this uh, displays itself in his manner of is displayed in his manner of writing that um, you feel that his whole idea of himself is behind everything that he says. Well, this also means that he rather tends to disregard or to despise philosophy produced in a more easygoing, relaxed, business-like, vocational manner that he wishes to distance himself from that altogether. And he doesn't want to make the thing too easy. He doesn't want to express himself in a way that people can pick up uh, by simply running their eyes over the pages. It, this is an instrument for changing the whole intellectual aspect of its readers' lives. And so the way to it is made difficult. I think that could be a justification relative to his intentions of the, his way of proceeding. I must say the prose does seem to me to have extraordinary quality. I find the sentences supercharged. They have uh, this haunting capacity to stay in the mind and one finds oneself quoting them very easily after one's read the book. Uh, I would regard Wittgenstein as one of those few philosophers like Plato or Schopenhauer or Nietzsche who are also great literary artists, great writers. Uh, would you agree with that? I think he is. Uh, he's certainly a very conscious artist. He was a distinguished mind, a cultivated man. Uh, he didn't make a mess of it, therefore. There's nothing you couldn't say of his work that it was ever pretentious. It pretends to great things. It makes claims of itself. But it seems to me the literary garment of his thought is worthy of the seriousness with which he presented those thoughts. I think we must go back a bit now to what some of the doctrines were. We talked about this central notion of language picturing the world. And you explained how he distinguished between true utterances and false utterances. Does he provide us with any way of seeing if a statement pictures the world? Of seeing if our utterances are true or false? What kind of analysis of the utterance will show us whether it's true or false? There's absolutely no explanation, as I said earlier, of what the simple objects are, and therefore there's no account given of, so to speak, how we come to be aware of the simple objects. All he talks about is what the relation between the basic propositions of discourse and the objects to which they relate must be. What he does do is suggest various ways in which the sentences of ordinary discourse can be analyzed or decomposed into these ultimate basically pictorial sentences. That his theory is that every genuine proposition that isn't itself one of these ultimate sentences, and he doesn't give any examples of actual everyday propositions that are, every such proposition must be decomposable into them. And his thesis is, to put it in a slightly technical way, that every genuine proposition, whatever, is a truth function of elementary propositions, which in effect means that it's just an 
an, abbreviate, an abbreviated formula for a vast assemblage, a conjunction of elementary propositions and the negations thereof. Well, I think before we move away from the Tractatus and its doctrines, which Wittgenstein himself did because he came to think that they were unsatisfactory, uh, it would probably be helpful if you would summarize, if you now could, what the central doctrines of that book are. Well, the central doctrine, I think, is that language in its fundamentally distinctive use as a means for describing the world can work only by picturing the world. How it pictures the world is through configuring names of objects, names of simple objects, into arrangements that correspond where the proposition is true to an actual arrangement of objects, which correspond where the proposition is false to a possible arrangement of objects. Uh, from this, of course, it follows that the world is an array of some sort of simple objects, exhibiting one of the possibilities of combination that are open to them. Connected with this is the view that although many genuine propositions we utter don't seem to be of this form, they can be dismantled, analyzed into propositions of this form. There is one thing we haven't talked about, which is of very great influence, his view of log the nature of logic and mathematics. He insisted that this, the propositions of logic and mathematics don't describe the world. They're, so to speak, a byproduct of the abbreviated nature of actual language. What a logical truth does is state what should be evident, namely that one proposition contains within itself another proposition. That is, some complex of pictures of the elementary pictures of the world contains in its content certain other. But some of them. So in other words, according to that theory, all the truths of mathematics, like all the truths of logic, are tautologies. Are tautologies. Just unpacking what is already there in the proposition. Yes, that they give no information about the world itself. They're simply symbolic in character, as it were. They talk about the relation of symbolism. And again, he said that these propositions were senseless in that they had no factual content. They didn't tell us anything about how things were when how things were was different from how they might have been. They simply reflect the character of the language we use. Now, what was the influence of this early philosophy of Wittgenstein? It was, in fact, very great, wasn't it? Very considerable, but it was exercised through only a small part of the work he produced. The greater part of the Tractatus is concerned with this theory of propositions as pictures, words as names, the things propositions related to as configurations of simple objects or facts. That's the great bulk of the book, the first, say, two-thirds of it or something like that. And in that form, I think it's fair to say that nobody took it up at all. People were baffled and astounded and puzzled by it. But the group of philosophers who claimed to derive their main inspiration from Wittgenstein, namely the positivists of the Vienna Circle, Although they accepted the view that there must be some basic propositions which relate, as it were, directly to the world, there must be a point in language where direct contact with the world is made, they gave a much more straightforward and easily intelligible account of this relation. In essence, it was that these elementary propositions simply describe the sense experiences of individual observers. So they report immediate occurrences of experience, feeling, um, perceptions uh, by individual persons, and then that everything else could be, all the other beliefs we held could be analyzed out into propositions of this kind, propositions about continuing material objects that exist unperceived, propositions about minds other than our own, propositions about social institutions, that all of these could be analyzed in the end down to simple reports of um, private experience. Now, when Wittgenstein began to become dissatisfied himself with this philosophy of his that he'd published in the Tractatus, which way did his own dissatisfaction proceed? I think perhaps I might say a little bit here about what Wittgenstein was doing in the interim. You spoke earlier in general terms about his career, the engineering at Manchester, the becoming interested in the nature of mathematics, the studying of Russell, the going to Cambridge to work with Russell. And at this period, he was an extremely isolated figure, perhaps locked up mainly in his own thoughts, talking to one or two people, particularly Russell. And the philosophy of the Tractatus reflects that in a way by being an immensely individualistic philosophy. There's no suggestion of 
language in a way being a communicative instrument, it's an instrument for reporting to oneself, to, for describing. There's no emphasis on it being a medium a social, of exchange. Uh, well, as I said, quite compatibly with the doctrines of the Tractatus, he thought he'd got all the answers, and so at that point he gave up the subject. And in the, for a number of years, in the 1920s, he was an elementary school teacher. Then he worked as a monastery gardener, helped design a house for his sister. And it wasn't until the end of the 1920s that he took the subject up again. He got into conversations with various leading figures of what was to become the Vienna Circle. And this interested him in philosophy again. I mean, one could reasonably suppose that philosophical thoughts were going through his mind in the interim, but it clearly wasn't part of his plan of life to continue thinking about philosophy after the publication of the Tractatus. Then he was stimulated into thinking of, about philosophy again, and of course the very different second philosophy of Wittgenstein developed from that period onward. Now, at first it seems that he was quite well disposed towards the particular interpretation that the Vienna Circle gave of his account of what the fundamental elements of language are, namely um, their view of them as reports of experience, not just configurated names of simple objects with no explanation of how those objects relate to our awareness. Uh, but he moved away from that, I think, reasonably soon. Remember, he returned to Cambridge in 1929 and stayed there in various capacities until getting involved in various sorts of war work. And in this period, he produces a completely different philosophy, which is no, does not offer one clear, definite, uh, abstract principles about the essential nature of language, but approaches language as a natural human phenomenon, something that we find going on around us, a, a, a very complicated overlapping array of human practices, like one another in some ways, different from one another in other ways. And an essential feature of this later, later philosophy is that language is essentially a public or social phenomenon, that it can only function if there are rules that are accepted by more than one person, so that any one person's use of the rules which guide him in speaking is open to correction and improvement by another person's I think, observation. Yes, I think probably the, the easiest way into the later philosophy of Wittgenstein and into seeing how it differs from the earlier philosophy is to start with the two different theories of meaning in the two different philosophies. We talked earlier about how the uh, the, the central theory of meaning in the early philosophy was that a proposition is a picture of the world, a picture of reality. This central metaphor is changed in the later philosophy. He no longer sees meaning as being a picture of the world at all or anything like that. He sees the meaning of, a, of an utterance as consisting in the use to which it can be put. In other words, he sees uh, a sentence as a, not a picture but a tool. And the meaning of this sentence is, so to speak, the sum total of its possible uses. And this, of course, as you were just saying, relates it to human activity and ultimately, indeed, to different ways of life. Now, this shift in, what, in, a, in the view of what meaning is, is absolutely fundamental to the whole philosophy. And a whole mass of changes from the earlier philosophy then follow from that, don't they? Can you, can you so to speak, take the story up from there? Yes. Uh, what we've got here, I think, is, in a way, best expressed through the two metaphors that I think both cropped up in what you just said then. First of all, the reference, constant reference from language to games, which is incorporated in a crucial technical term of the later philosophy, the notion of a language game. Incidentally, can I just interrupt to say I think that this metaphor has been extremely unfortunate because a lot of people have concluded from the fact that Wittgenstein is always talking about language games and the use of language as a game, that he somehow regarded all utterance as frivolous. And that confirms a lot of the prejudices that some people have about linguistic philosophy, that they're well, just that's certainly, playing with words. That was certainly not not his intention. Mm. It was just to draw uh, notice to two features of games. The first one, simply that they're rule-governed practices, and a lot follows from this in a way about how the rules of a game can change and uh, the games can be resemble one another in all sorts of different ways. That second point leads on to the second feature about games, which is that there's no common characteristic to all games. Games, as he says, are related to one, to one another by family resemblance. And that, applied back to language, means the various kinds of activity we perform with language, asking questions, cursing, greeting, praying, to give some examples he enumerates, these are all different 
things we do with language. Now, the game analogy, I agree, might seem to carry with it the suggestion that therefore these things are just for fun or pastimes or what have you. But the other analogy that you mentioned was the analogy of language to a system, of, a set of tools which are used with a purpose. I mean, there's these two things about language. It's a purposive undertaking, and yet it's carried out with items which are governed by conventional and alterable rules. Well, now, uh, this notion of language uh, had a lot of influence outside philosophy, didn't it? Um, especially in anthropology and sociology. Can you say something about how they were affected by this new notion of meaning? Well, I think one needs to precede that by one remark about his view of, later view of the nature of philosophy itself. There is a great continuity between his earlier and later general view about philosophy, namely that it's essentially an activity and not a theory, to use the formula of the Tractatus. It's something that you do, philosophy. It's not something you arrive at and can... Uh, it's not a body of doctrine. Body of, a statable, final body of doctrine. Mm. Um, he says that quite explicitly in the Tractatus. It remains the case in the investigations. He says one shouldn't put forward philosophical theories. They simply augment confusion. What one does as a philosopher is to assemble reminders about the way in which language is actually used in its various forms, the various distinct but not utterly unrelated games, language games in which it is employed. One assembles reminders of these to prevent people from running away with misleading analogies. The misleading analogy he had perhaps most prominently in mind was the tendency to think because we say, I felt a pain, or I have a pain. A pain is some kind of definite, identifiable inner object, private to us, which we notice within ourselves and report to other people. And he, a very great deal of the investigations is concerned to break the hold of that picture of how we talk about our own mental life. That is the reporting of private experiences. That picture is precisely uh, the sort of picture that his earlier theory of language, as put out in the Tractatus, would lead one to adopt. Do you think that there's any truth in the following? That, that when uh, Wittgenstein published the Tractatus, he was, as it were, bewitched by a single theory of language, namely the, the picture theory, that he later came to realize that this was false and that being bewitched by a misleading theory of language had resulted in a whole, a wholly mistaken way of doing philosophy. And therefore, he came to uh, think that before you could really do philosophy, you had to carry out an investigation of the different ways in which language can mislead us mm. so as not to be misled in our thinking about the world, and that this itself became a way of doing philosophy. In other words, an invest a multiple investigation into the different ways in which false assumptions about language can mislead us in our thinking about the world. Do you think there's any truth in that? Well, it's undoubtedly true that a great deal of the investigations takes the form of a criticism of his earlier doctrines. Certainly the first quarter of it is largely directed towards attacking the notion that words are essentially names. His view is that the use of names is one of these language games, one element in language. The teaching of names is a language game. We have to understand a great deal of language, he maintains, in order to understand the, activi the activities that someone's engaging in who's trying to tell us what the name of something is. So he wants to argue there's no absolute or fundamental priority to the notion of naming. It's just one of the things that language does. From that, he goes on to attacking this idea that there are ultimately simple objects and ultimately simple propositions. He insists that simplicity is always relative to some particular investigation. And so there's this enormous sense that has developed of language as a public, available social reality, not language as some kind of essence which you can work out in your head by pure reasoning in the later work. One analogy that's been drawn a great deal is with psychoanalysis in the following sense, that Wittgenstein is saying that, that we first of all become, as it were, knotted up in our view of some particular aspect of reality by a false use of language, and that the task of philosophy is to untie these knots. And uh, this, so to speak, therapeutic aspect of philosophical activity has often been said to be very like what Freud thought the psychoanalyst was doing in another direction. Do you think that uh, a similarity exists there? Yes, I think there certainly is a similarity in that uh, 
Wittgenstein's abstention from theory in his later philosophy is just like the Freudian analyst's abstention from saying, what's wrong with you? Is you're madly in love with your mother, which doesn't produce any effect at all. The procedure has to be much more circuitous in that the person has to be brought by re reliving a whole lot of past experiences, by being reminded of all sorts of thoughts and feelings he's had, that his emotions have a certain peculiar structure, so that something is eventually brought up out of the unconscious. In Wittgenstein's case, what is hidden isn't hidden in quite the same way. What, is, what is, has to be made evident to the philosophically confused or perplexed person is the way the rules of the language games that people actually use. What has happened to him is he's on the basis of an analogy he's seen between the way words work in one game and the way they worked in, and worked in another. He applies the rules of the first game to the second one and gets into a fix. Thinks that because in a shop I say that's a bicycle, that's a television set, that's a so-and-so, I'm doing something just analogous to that when I look within myself and say I have an acute pain in my left knee, a pronounced desire for a cup of tea and a wish that it was Friday. Um, <laughs> he wants to say these are two utterly different operations, yes. that one's not, not yes. just listing off things that one finds within oneself in self-description. And the way to do this, he maintains, is to consider language in its natural setting, to see all the circumstances in which people say things, the behavior that characteristically accompanies their saying certain things. Can I now bring you back to the question of what the influence of this philosophy has been, especially outside philosophy? I fail to take up that question. You're quite right. The influence of it has been, I suppose, to encourage a certain kind of relativism, because the Abstention from theory means, and is connected with, a recognition, so to speak, of the equal rights of all language games, provided that it passes the test of workability as a social instrument of communication, then it constitutes what he calls a form of life. And he doesn't think you can really understand some, as it were, unfamiliar language game without actually participating, without playing it, so to speak. Well, now, the, you spoke of influence of this on anthropology and sociology. All right, a certain form of anthropology and sociology, if you like, looks at social orders utterly different from those in which the student of the subject himself lives, and he then proceeds to criticize what's going on there in the light of the accepted rules of his own society, when the whole notion, as it were, of the savage, where people say, well, presumably savage languages, because their life is so technologically unadvanced, their language is presumably going to be a few grunts. Whereas, of course, this is not true at all. The languages of technically primitive people are of an enormous degree of complexity. And then one sees, oh, I don't know, rules of taboo or rules that we call taboo, which is already a somewhat derogatory phrase because it suggests this is a rule which is based on false assumptions of what connects with what. And he would say, I think that's just a misunderstanding bred by not actually being a party to, not fully being within the form of life in which these taboo rules operate. What, speaking for yourself, do you think is, is wrong with this later philosophy? Unless, of course, you, you buy it whole. No, I certainly don't buy it whole. What I think is important about it, I do think the philosophy of mind, the account of our discourse about our own mental life and that of others, has given very good reason for abandoning an assumption that was traditionally made, that there was a kind of huge cleavage between our thought and discourse about the physical world and our thought and discourse about the mind. It did bring to light that the great deal of what we have to say about our own and other people's mental lives is essentially tied to behavior. As it were, being generous, the test of whether a person is generous is what they give and when, not whether they have generous impulses. A person who claims to have endless generous impulses but actually always lets the plate pass by, uh, one supposes he's either being insincere or is at best deceiving himself. Well, the generous impulse, as it were, Wittgenstein's point is neither here nor there. It's to, for a person to be generous is for them to act in a certain way in certain circumstances. But, and yet, after all, generosity is a character trait. It's part, an aspect of an individual's mind. The mind isn't a hidden, private thing altogether. And that, I think, is important in the later work. What I object to myself is the abstention from theory, if you like, that nothing ever seems to come to an end, nothing ever gets settled, 
the examples are heaped up and then, as it were, they're offered to you to take or to leave. It seems to me an intellectually unsatisfactory practice. The whole manner of exposition of the investigations is a kind of cumulative and disorderly persuasion rather than definitely setting out something that is to be discussed and saying, well, in favor of it, so-and-so is to be said, against it, so-and-so is to be said. It's, I don't say this is in any sense a mannerism on Wittgenstein's part. It represents a commitment, a belief on his part that this is the way the subject should be done. I just don't believe it can be done like that or that um, understanding of a lasting kind is achieved by this consciously inconclusive way of proceeding. If one takes three paces back and looks at the two philosophies of Wittgenstein, the earlier and the later one, uh, there seem to me to be at least three ways in which they are viewed by other philosophers who are themselves very distinguished. Uh, I suppose a large number of philosophers, perhaps most, regard both the early and the late philosophy as being works of genius. But some, uh, Bertrand Russell is an example, regarded the first philosophy as being the product of genius, but the later philosophy as being trivial and, well, really, he kept saying, he thought, a worthless exercise. There are other philosophers, and Karl Popper is one, for example, who doesn't think at all highly of either of them. How do you evaluate them in their relation to each other? Well, I'm perhaps docile enough to be quite convinced that Wittgenstein is a genius and that both stages of his work are works of genius. But as so often in philosophical works, this isn't because everything is said in them is true. The, uh, who, who would deny, after all, that Plato was a genius? Yet who would believe Plato's view of the universe, that what really exists is abstract, timeless entities, and the world of things in space and time is a sort of shadowy appearance? One could recognize the genius of a philosopher without, in fact, accepting very much of what he says. The genius might consist, as it, one might say very evidently in the case of Kant, in asking questions of a more fundamental and powerful kind than people had asked before, challenging assumptions that had gone hitherto unchallenged. And I think in both parts of his work, this is achieved. Thank you very much. I think I must say that I think that you've succeeded in doing something that uh, is very difficult to do, and that is making two philosophies uh, intelligible in a space that in this series we're normally devoting to one. Thank you very much, Anthony Quinton. <laughs>